The Listening Gallery, an exploration of medieval art. Throughout this tour, through the Walker Art Gallery's medieval collection, I combine the social historical context with an in-depth first, second and third stage analysis, concentrating on the use of symbolism and iconography to tell the story of the artworks and their meanings. Here we witness a typical medieval portrayal of the life of Christ, from his birth depicted by the Annunciation and Adoration of the Kings and of the Shepherds on the left, to his sacrificial death in the crucifixion on the right. Despite the fact the piece is damaged and the middle altar panel is absent, these juxtaposing scenes appear to parallel each other beautifully. Composed so that they face one another, these wings indicate a sense of morbid foreshadowing, symbolising the evolution of Jesus' life and transgression to the becoming the martyr he is renowned for today. In order to create this narrative, the artist appears to use with this altarpiece a series of montages, combining various scenes together to provide himself with more space. Painted from 1350 to 1400 in the Florentine Guild, this triple panelled altarpiece perfectly indicates the power and hold religion had over people's everyday lives. Before the Renaissance, the main focus of this type of painting was initially to emphasise the importance of spirituality and connection with God, disregarding the natural form and portraying the inner spirit. Many artists at the time were trapped in an era where they were still under the influence of the church, with all artistic commissions commanded by either the clergy or high status families. Therefore, experimentation and a desire to break the boundaries of medieval practice were seen as sinful and highly disregarded. Altarpieces pieces such as this one presented the word of God in a visual form. Therefore, unlike biblical transcripts, this gave the everyday people the opportunity to connect with religion at a personal level. With the majority of people being illiterate at the time, these proved vital for the spiritual life of the community, transforming the role of art and instead making it a method of representing religion. This concept of creating visual images to portray a story is still used today in the form of graphic novels and comic scripts showing the impact this technique has had over multiple centuries. The exquisite attention to detail and size of this triptych indicates it would have been used for private devotion in the family home and also suitable for travelling. Mirroring the theme of religious iconography, this portrayal of the crucifixion, painted in the early 14th century from 1300 to 1325, further highlights the techniques of the medieval guilds. In this scene, Christ is depicted in the centre of the piece, nailed to the cross, portrayed in excruciating pain as he embraces his fate. Two figures can be seen on the left-hand side of the martyr, his grieving mother, the Virgin Mary, and St. John. In contrast to the recognisable saints, the figure on the right holds the status of a respected soldier, proven by his scarlet robes and iron chainmail. This man, no less, symbolises St. Longinus, a Roman centurion and man of godlike status, shown by his gold-encrusted halo. Unlike the previous figures, he is the only one who acknowledges Christ. With his eyes gazing heavenward and his right hand outstretched towards the corpse, it is here where he declares that Jesus is the rightful Son of God. When analysing this piece, it is evident that gilding has taken place, indicated by the excessive use of gold. 
To create gold leaf, gold was hammered into thin sheets and then placed onto the canvas, a common technique used during this period to heighten the status of art and religion with splendour and grace. It is therefore evident that this piece is a gold ground painting, as it was common that sacred artworks of the time created the sky just using gold leaf. This technique reached its height around 1300, first in Italy and the Byzantine Empire, before expanding to other European countries. Gold leaf was also used for the declaration of halos, shown in pieces such as this altarpiece. These were used in iconoclastic representations to distinguish the status of sacred figures. The same technique was also used in Greece, where it was used to depict commanders and heroes in mythology. The artist remains anonymous, however, by analysing his portrayal of figures' garments and facial expression, it is evident that he has been influenced by Byzantine art. This new art form concentrated almost entirely on religious expression, translating church theology into artistic terms, proceeding towards creating a new form of Eastern Christian images and icons. These masterpieces, along with fresco wall paintings, would have decorated the walls and domes of multiple churches. So beautiful was the effect of these mosaics that this new art form expanded, continuing its practice in Italy, especially Rome and Ravenna. Hinge marks implanted on the left-hand side of the panel are highly visible, indicating that this would have been painted as the right wing of a two-panel diptych. Next, we encounter a fresco by Spinello Arantino, painted in 1390, entitled Salome, the infant St. John the Baptist, presented to Zacharias. Fresco paintings were mostly perfected in the time of the Renaissance. However, during the medieval era, the technique was commonly used in churches throughout Europe. The reason why these artworks remain in pristine condition is due to the method they were created, involving wet plaster. Here, the base layer of the painting would have been constructed of two layers and then left to dry. However, to make the painting durable, once the second coat was applied, the design would have been sketched on and painted over while still wet, allowing the paint to become an integral part of the plaster. If the piece was ever reworked into, it would have been easily identified, as by painting on onto dry plaster often resulted to the flaking off of the paint, making it lose its vibrant colour. Similar to the triptych depiction of Christ's birth and execution, here we witness an illustration of the life of St John the Baptist. These frescoes originated from the Camelite Church in Florence. However, they had to be carefully removed after surviving of devastating fire in 1771. These two beautifully preserved wall paintings are unfortunately the only remaining fresco of the series, leaving a crucial part of the story incomplete. Similar to Christ's Annunciation and Crucifixion, in these damaged artworks, we see the saint in infancy and in a more abstract form, his death at the hands of Salome. When comparing both wall paintings against one another, it is the one portraying Salome that remains the most intriguing, as we are left without any visible connection between her and John the Baptist. After objectifying the marriage of Herod Antipas and his brother's wife Herodias, Salome's mother, 
the saint was imprisoned. Recognising the threat that John had against her mother, Salome became extremely protective over her. Therefore, after dancing before the guests at a banquet, she consulted with her mother what to ask the king. In response, her mother replied, the head of John the Baptist. The representation of Salome in art has varied, many depicting her innocence and the treachery of her mother. However, in Spinello Arantino's portrayal of her, in this fresco, we can see a hint of malice. Portrayed in white, symbolising purity and her elegant braided hair trailing down her back, she is presented like a childlike innocence. However, the way Arantino places her head slightly bowed with her cunning facial expression, instead of seeing an adolescent girl, we witness a willful, dominant woman, holding status and control over her thoughts and actions. In this fresco, we are left with a sense of wonder and unfulfillment, as due to the composition of her position and direction, it is possible that in this scene, she is presenting the decapitated head of the saint himself. In contrast to the barbaric, morbid portrayal of Christ's sacrifice at his crucifixion, Simone Martini's piece, Christ Discovered in the Temple, made from 1284 to 1344, we witness a scene of everyday domestic family life, depicting an adolescent Jesus in confrontation with his parents. Here Martini emphasises deep psychological tension, painting his characters with their mouths shut, indicating no verbal communication. The Virgin Mary, Christ's mother, appears seated on the left-hand side, questioning her son. Here, she is presented in a very traditional form, surrounded in a symbolic royal blue shroud. This is an iconic colour, regularly used in medieval art to symbolise the Virgin, as it remained a symbol of faithfulness and spirituality. Here the artist has deliberately made her easy to recognise. Jesus, however, appears distant from his mother, composed to the far right of the painting. Unlike the common portrayal of Christ as an innocent angelic infant at his birth and selfless martyr at his death, we instead see him as a rebellious adolescent, by his offensive posture appearing with his arms crossed and direct gaze of disappointment towards his own mother. In contrast to his wife and son, Joseph remains standing, composed in the middle of the canvas. Here, his left hand appears on Jesus' back and his right hand gesturing upwards towards the Virgin. Despite not being his father and appearing mortal, Joseph gains a sense of hierarchy in this frozen state of confrontation. Appearing at the top of the triangular composition, we can see his anger and frustration. In contrast to Mary and Jesus, whose vibrant colours of red and blue repel each other, Joseph wears purple. Purple pigment at the time was extremely rare to come by, indicating that Martini held a respected status as an artist, indicating that he was wealthy enough to purchase such an element. Symbolising royalty and wisdom by painting him like this, despite his mortal state, Joseph remains extremely significant to the piece, showing the power of humanity. In this scene, Martini portrays the biblical story of Christ abandoning his parents, while visiting a temple in Jerusalem, where he remained missing for three days. By portraying the royal family in a domestic setting, he highlights the concept of what it is like to be human. In this case, a traumatic ideal of losing a child and scolding them for their disobedience. This drastic act of abandonment foreshadows Christ's at gradual separation from his earth family and instead symbolises the start of his journey into manhood, advancing on his godlike path towards spirituality. 
Despite the restrictions held at the guilds, indicating no individuality, Martini's use of facial expressions, gestures and direct eye contact creates a clear narrative and connection between the figures, demonstrating natural human emotions. This is taken to the next level as we are also given the opportunity to see written communication through the use of Mary's prayer book, as in the form of Latin we see the questions he is asking, translated to, Son, why hast thou dealt with us thus? Here Martini ensures the durability of his piece by constructing it from tempera, made from binding natural pigments with egg. Unlike oil, this pigment dried very quickly, developing a hardened texture. This therefore challenged many artists like Martini to work very quickly with their materials, planning their compositions carefully, having to work va fast to maintain its decoration and form. This piece symbolises how this method allowed art to remain a pristine condition, preventing it from discolouring. Created over a century later, we recognise in Ercol de Roberti's Pieta, painted from 1482 to 1486, a transformation in style and technique, diverging away from the focus on two-dimensional forms to perspective. Composed in the centre of the canvas, Christ appears outstretched in the arms of his mother, the Virgin Mary, his body depicted as a haggard corpse, highlighting starvation and torture. Here we witness, firsthand, how the early Renaissance impacted artists like Roberti, inspiring them to create a contextual, emotional background behind their practice and the topics they wished to pursue. In this piece, we see just that, as not only does Roberti portray the present, a mother grieving over her dead son, but incorporates elements of the past and future into the story. In the background, we witness the scene of his execution, where many are suffering the same fate. However, in the foreground, on the left, the artist also depicts his burial tomb, emphasising his forthcoming resurrection. By the way Roberti has painted his figures, it is clear that he adapted the same style which was developing in Northern Europe at the time. In contrast to Italy's idealistic, romanticised portrayal of the elegant, graceful Holy Family, he focuses more on depicting reality, on subjects such as pain and suffering, which affected everyday people. This is proven by his portrayal of the figures and the landscape itself, as Roberti creates an emotional setting, mirroring Christ's suffering with the barren, rocky surroundings. Unlike Martini's portrayal of the Virgin in the previous piece, in Pieta, Mary is depicted as an ordinary woman, grieving over her only child. In contrast to wearing royal blue, she instead wears black, not only symbolising mourning and grief, but also her social status, as this was often worn by beggars and farmers during the time period. Direct links can also be made with Michelangelo's sculpture, Pieta, made in 1498, balancing the Renaissance ideals of classical beauty with naturalism to produce an extremely detailed portrayal of a mother losing a son. To conclude our journey, we see André Alessi's version of Saint Jerome reading in a cave, made from 1470 to 72. Unlike the most iconic portrayal of Saint Jerome, the patron saint of scholars, contemplating in his study, André Alessi carves the renowned saint in a juxtaposing setting, withering in his old age. Here the artist focuses on depicting Jerome's life after undertaking his pilgrimage to the Holy Land, retiring to the desolate plains of the Syrian desert to pay penitence and live as a hermit. 
In paintings where Jerome is regularly dressed in a grey tunic, the colour of humility, standing near a dead tree, a reference to the tree of knowledge, a symbol of sin and temptation, here he is instead depicted in a cave. In contrast to traditional pictorial representations of this scene, where colour is crucial to heighten symbolism, Alessi carves it from stone. Combining smooth curves with sharp angles, he therefore creates an aesthetic cave setting, making the artwork appear conceptual for the period. However, despite there being an absence of colour, we as an audience are still able to recognise certain symbols more effectively. In this case, Alessi's use of animals confronting one another. Here we see the animal kingdom being used as symbols of purity and damnation. In relation to the Bible, both the serpent and dragon, cold-blooded reptiles, symbolise sin and temptation, linking to the creation of Adam and Eve and their banishment from paradise. Both venomous creatures appear to be in confrontation with symbols of power, such as the bold eagle and the king of all beasts, the mighty lion. These animals represent the saint's never-ending struggle between sin and paganism, a representation of the challenges and temptations he put himself through in such a discomforting place. The lion is of particular importance as it shares a personal bond with Jerome himself. After conducting a holy lesson with his brethren one day, a lion paraded into the monastery. While everyone fled, it was Saint Jerome who recognised the creature's injury, and in doing so bathed the beast to find a thorn stuck in his paw. Once he had removed it, he then had a revelation, that God had sent him this creature as his protector and defender, a symbol of loyalty and purity. Alessi also includes the saint resting on what appears to be a hat. This symbolises the status and hierarchy he once held as a Cardinal of Rome, the fact that he is standing on it possibly indicates his fall from grace. Born in Dalmatia, now present-day Croatia, like his subject, Andrea Alessi found a bond with Saint Jerome and continued to produce many reflections on him as a recurring motif in his work.